Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupomier. And today we're going to be discussing stroke. Right. Serious topic. You know, it is a serious topic. And um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an anecdote about how this, uh, how this initially got included. And actually, this anecdote tells a little bit about the creation of the, uh, the medical handbook that ah. we created and the um, inspiration for this lecture series. And uh, it was in um, it was November or December, um, and I was um, on my way to Baduda, Uganda. And maybe at some point, some of the, the staff in Baduda, Uganda, will be watching these videos. Maybe. Um, but I was, I was there, and um, I was asked to do some continuing medical education at the end of the clinic days. And I thought, well, you know, I have in my head what, what I think we should be talking about what I consider the hot, important topics. Right. But I asked the staff and I said, what, what, what topics would you like me to, to discuss? And the topic that had the most number of people requesting it was stroke. Oh. And I was a little bit surprised because we think I'm in sub-Saharan Africa. It's the tail end of the malaria season. Right. Um, you know, we're seeing all these febrile kids every day. Sure. But stroke didn't, didn't seem like, um, you know, it was that high on my radar. Um, so, but it, it made me realize a couple of things. One is that um, stroke can be devastating. Absolutely. It can be traumatic. When, yep. when a patient has a stroke or one of the staff members has a stroke or one of the providers in the family or community or one of the leaders has a stroke, um, even though stroke um, happens usually above the age of 55 yeah. and 75% of the time it's above the age of 65. Um, a lot of these individuals can be really important in the community also. And seeing them suddenly right. um, lose the ability to speak, lose the ability to, to move a limb um, yeah. can really be devastating, frightening. And uh, something I think that a lot of people want to understand sure. Um, on the level of what do you do when it's happening, um, but also what do you do so that this doesn't happen. Oh. So it made me um, maybe really think through um, what, do you, what do you do about stroke when you have lots of resources, where, where I did most of my training, what do you do about stroke where the resources might be limited? Hmm. And initially I thought, well, oh, there's not much we can do other than prevention until I started thinking through. And so today, hopefully, we're gonna be going through what can you do with whatever resources are at hand. Great. And I'm, I'm assuming, you know, you're, you're a man of, uh, of Advanced age. <laughs> <laughs> I'll spare you the... <laughs> I was gonna say over the age of 65. Absolutely. That's probably fair. Um, Very so fair. So you've probably had either family or relatives or friends yeah, I've, I've had a few individuals. One of them was a fishing partner of mine, and uh, his stroke was induced by a clot which occurred after he was declared 100% better after a bypass operation. Mm -hmm. So a cardiac, so a heart surgery. Exactly, and uh, you, of course they put you on blood thinners, as they call them, or anti-clotting agents to keep that from happening, but it can still happen, and mm -hmm. uh, it did happen. And he survived that stroke, and he survived enough to be able to go back and fish. Mm -hmm. But his speech was, it was interesting, because every now and then he would come into a glitch. And he, he knew what he wanted to say, but something gibberish came out. Mm -hmm. and he says, he would say something like, I just told you that I caught a fish. But what I heard was, <laughs> something yeah. like that. And it was a very strange fishing partner that I had after that. Yeah. No, it's, um, uh, it's difficult. He lasted for several years after that without incident, but mm -hmm. that was a permanent part of his persona after that. Well, as I mentioned, 75%, three quarters yeah. of the time, this is yeah. happening in people over the age of 65, which means a quarter of the time, this is happening in someone under the age of 75. Exactly. So strokes can occur in individuals who are younger. Yep. So not just, this is not just a disease of people who reach advanced age. Yes. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what, what is a stroke. Right. And um, there's, I will say, two main forms of stroke. One is uh, ischemic stroke, 
where you're failing to get blood supply to a part of the brain. And this can either be a localized area closes, yes. or maybe more commonly something is thrown, thromboembolic, um, where an right. embolism actually goes and then blocks off a, a, a distribution of the blood supply to a part of the brain. Right. Um, and the other type of stroke, which is actually less common, is hemorrhagic, where you actually have bleeding into a part of the brain. Of course. Um, so those are going to be our two main types of strokes. Um, and then the stroke itself, we can break down into, um, into phases. There's an acute, and there's sort of a right up front acute, and then a second phase. And then there's going to be chronic issues. So let's, let's talk a little bit. Um, I don't know if you've ever had um, the misfortune or, or opportunity to be with someone who was having a stroke? Not during, but um, several hours afterwards. Okay. Um, the, the acute phase actually lasts that, that window, and we're going we're gonna to be using these paradigms of acute um, and second phase when we talk about our treatments. Right. Um, but usually the onset of symptoms <clears throat> is pretty abrupt. Yes. It's all of a sudden. Right. You'll be with the person and, um, and then a loss of function of the affected part of the brain. So quite commonly, we can have a, um, a, a hemiplegia, a hemiparesis, where half of the body is not functional. So they might suddenly the left arm they can't raise, or suddenly it might be the right arm, or it might be the arm and leg. Um, that's usually when people start to sense that something is wrong. Absolutely. Um, there, there often is preservation of consciousness. The person is, is, is alert. And they know what's going on. And they know what's going on. They may have trouble communicating it, as you described in your friend, yeah, yeah. The, the aphasia, the That's difficulty right. expressing right. oneself. Um, so we start off with this acute onset of symptoms. And then if we don't do something about it, we can move into a second or eventually a chronic phase where this disability becomes permanent, mm -hmm. something that can't be reversed. Um, so a couple of things I think we talked about is the localized loss of motor function. That's quite common. Yep. Sometimes it's a visual disturbance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be an inability to speak. And th those are kind of your classic warning signs that one of these events is going on. Um, how do, we, how do we make the diagnosis? How do we know that it's a stroke? Well, you could do an angiogram. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that, that is, that's interesting. In, um, you know, we, we have done a lot of our training in an area in the world where there's quite a bit of resource. <laughs> yes, there is. And what there are in resource rich areas are um, stroke centers. Right. Where they will quickly bring high technology to bear. And one of the first things they're trying to determine is this distinction between a, a thromboembolic, so a clot-based yeah, stroke, right. versus a bleeding, a hemorrhagic stroke. Exactly. And the importance being is that if you try to intervene and open up that clot, use blood thinners or blood thinning or thrombolytic medications in someone who's bleeding, sure. that's it worse. gonna make it worse, it's exactly. not. Exactly. Um, so in addition to your history and your physical, in a lot of um, resource rich areas, uh, a CAT scan will CAT quickly scan. be done to determine whether or not there's bleeding okay. to help with the algorithm. Um, so assume there's no bleeding. Now, where do you find the clot? So um, the clot, interesting enough, even though you could do MRI technology, so magnetic resonance, um, time is brain, as we like to say. Right. Um, so what you're looking at doing is opening up this area that's yes, affected. That's right. That's right. You're going to have a sense of what area is affected based upon the deficiency, sure. the localization sure. to loss of, of function. Of and you don't necessarily need to know for a therapeutic point um, what that is. Huh. You need to know, is it a significant distribution? Is it one where the, the risks, there will be risks of opening up one of these clots, that the, the benefit is going to outweigh the the potential risks. Right. So some of the things, and this is our diagnosis and treatment are tied together. So right. the diagnosis is going to be compatible symptoms. Right. If you have the imaging, you might actually look to make this distinction. Um, if you don't, you're going to have to make quite a judgment here <laughs> about, sure. you know, am I going to risk further bleeding if I don't have the ability to do imaging? Right. 
Um, because one of the mainstays of the acute treatment of stroke is thrombolytic therapy. Right. And this is injecting a, a medicine into the blood supply yep. that is actually going to go up to, not the community blood supply, but the individual's blood understood, supply. Understood, understood. <laughs> um, that is actually going to potentially open this up. Um, and there's a, there's a window of opportunity. And we actually, in our book, we talk about, we say that um, maybe about four and a half hours is when the window oh. starts to close. So you have a little bit of time. Your stroke centers are going to try to run through the protocol more quickly. Um, in addition to that, we do things that affect platelets. Um, yeah. We might start aspirin within the 48 hours um, if there isn't a contraindication. And this may be something that even without thrombolytic therapy, you might consider introducing. Um, interesting enough, in the management of acute stroke, fluids, fluid management, oh. correct, correction of electrolyte disturbances, oh. so a focus on glycemic control. You don't want the sugars too low, you don't want the sugars too high. Um, another thing, and you, you mentioned that your friend was, he lasted several years. He did. One of the issues, both acute <coughs> and chronically, in people that have had strokes mm -hmm. is losing the ability to protect the airway. So they can actually aspirate, and it may not be the stroke itself that kills them, oh, but during I the see. acute phase, oh, they can actually end up getting secretions, they can end up aspirating, developing okay. pneumonia. Um, there also can be fever associated with the stroke itself. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's something else going on, but when you have fever with stroke, you actually have a doubling, twice the acute death rate, a doubling of mortality. Mm -hmm. So people actually might start looking back to our controlling fever chapter. Oh, you nice. actually want to control uh, hydration status, fluid status, electrolyte status, you want to control fever and blood pressure. So aspirin actually does two things then. It actually does. Yeah, <laughs> it does. So is that substance that you didn't give a name to that you inject to dissolve the clot? Is that streptodornase? Is that so, one so, of those? Yeah, strepto, streptokinase. Kinase. I'm streptokinase. Sorry. Um, it actually um, was one of the original ones and it was isolated from a microbe, right? Yep. Um, there's also um, TPA, um, ah, which that's is. Right which is sort of a modern sure. one, but, but still um, both might find uses in certain areas. Uh -huh. So there are certain you know, named agents that we use for the thrombolysis. Sure. Um, and then blood pressure. We're just talking a little bit about blood pressure. Because this relates to hypertension and we just covered that. It does, episodes. and we're gonna, we're gonna hit blood pressure twice here. We're gonna oh, hit it in okay. the acute phase. Oh, so the okay. acute phase, um, you know, what, what's the best blood pressure medicine? The one you have, I'm gonna say. <laughs> um, and they've looked at this and there was a lot of ideas. I think that your calcium channel blockers would be the best agent, maybe your beta blockers. Um, it seems odd to me, a diuretic, if you think about, because you're worried about hydration. So maybe that's not a great exactly, agent. Exactly. Um, but the most important thing is you wanna actually get your blood pressure down about 15%. You don't wanna normalize it because part of the elevated blood pressure is essential for continu continuing to supply the brain with, um, with blood. Sure. So we talk about a goal of 180 over 105 and about a 15% reduction ah. in the first 24 hours. Right. But meanwhile, this patient is conscious and he knows or she knows that everything that you're doing to them has the potential to either save their life or take it. That's true. So they're, if they're suffering from hypertension to begin with, it's, I can't believe that you could actually control someone's blood pressure at that moment because they're so panicked over mm -hmm. the fact that they think any minute they could die. Mm -hmm. And that's a horrible thought for anyone to contemplate. Yeah. Isn't it? Well, I think that's good that you bring this up because you know, we're, we're focused, oh, we'll give this medicine, give that medicine. Yeah. Um, but of note is most individuals, when they are having a stroke, are aware of what's going on. Sure. And this is where I'll say good bedside manner talking to the patient, realizing, you know, saying, you know, we're here, we're taking care of you, we're right. doing everything we right. can. Right. Um, just because they can't speak to you, yeah. don't assume that they don't understand what's going on. Exactly. And that, I, ha I have to say, that's an error that I see often made, oh, I'm sure. is we focus on, we're trying to make sure we do everything we need to do. <laughs> yeah, but, well, probably but, the first thing you need to do is take, take care, care of the patient. That's right, exactly. Right. Um, yeah, so we've got, We've got a lot of these acute things. Um, 
but then you're going to get through this window. And, and I want to, before we move, I want to just make sure I make this one point. You may say, well, we don't have thrombolytic therapy in our clinic. We don't have CAT scans in our clinic. But this True. is, again, the decision that we talk about um, in many of our lectures. You always want to know what resources are available. Also. Because there's a certain amount of time. If there's a stroke center two hours away, you, you may want to try to get them there. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the situation in Uganda when you started to give them their uh, sort of a CME course on, on stroke? Did well, they have the, a place for stroke victims to go to take advantage of this? So um, Baduda is a very remote um, part of Uganda. It's a far eastern. You basically can... So you on know, the shores of Lake you can, Victoria? So actually it's northeast. You pass that's along the shores on your way. Nice. Um, but you're very close to the Kenya border. There is a... Um, there's a number of smaller clinics. There is a hospital there. Ah. And then another hour away is the next biggest town. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's important, even though you say our small clinic, we see 100 patients a day. We've got this hospital right here. But then you've got to ask, I've got a certain window of opportunity. When did the symptoms start? And is it going to make sense to try to transport someone to a a place with like um, Kinshasa. Is there a Kinshasa is very far, <coughs> um, but there was a, a closer town. Is it a two hour helicopter ride by any chance? <laughs> Not a lot of helicopters that you're going to have yeah, access okay. to. Um, and actually, what they did do is they, um, as I was leaving, they had bought a uh, motorcycle ambulance. And so it's a, it's a motorcycle with a sidecar, and the sidecar, the person lays oh, down. Right. Because even the roads can be quite impass mm. impassable at times by also, cars. Sure. So. sure. Um, wow. So we get through our acute phase and we talk about what do we do now long term? Do we say, oh, you've had this stroke and, and that's tough and you're going to have this disability. Um, they're actually, and we go through this in our book, we talk about that the prognosis, um, usually people will have significant impairments, unfortunately, yeah. if you're not able to um, open up the blood supply. Yeah. Um, but a lot of rehabilitation, a lot of um, physical therapy. Sure. Um, th there are a lot of things you can do after a stroke that can allow someone to continue to perform the activities of daily living. That's right. Um, so you, you don't necessarily just say, oh, it's all over. Right. You know, you, there, is, there is potential, even though sure. the immediate stroke might be devastating, Indeed. to regain a lot of function. Indeed. In fact, I've, I've had, actually, now that you mentioned <laughs> long-term sequelae, uh, I had two fishing partners that developed stroke. The first one, of course, was the individual I told you about that had speech impediment for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And the second um, fishing partner uh, had a stroke that left him partially paralyzed and was anxious to get back to fishing. Okay. So we consulted with a physical therapist at uh, Columbia, okay. a woman uh, from Sweden, a very uh, uh, well-constructed physical person who could okay. massage any part of your body or get you to do whatever you'd like. And when we, uh, when the three of us got together in his apartment in New Jersey to actually go over the strategy, she began by asking him, well, what would you like to be able to do again? I like that. That's, so yeah. she, so he says, I want to fish. Okay. And she says, well, what kind of fishing? Because she was intrigued. He says, I'm a fly fisherman. He's my partner. He says, I want to be able to fish. And she knew nothing about it. He says, I'll teach you how to do it if you'll get me back on the river. I like that. And you know what? She did. In, in six months time from the time he had his stroke, we were fishing again. Not as well as last time. And he almost needed a walker in order to get out into the river. Mm -hmm. But he was stable once he did. And so we rigged him up with a walker that had, um, it had a special... Uh, projections off the legs so that you could stick them between the rocks, right? Oh, interesting. This is yeah. crazy, but and, and we did it. And here he was in his rocker out there, or walker rather, fly casting, catching fish. That's and fantastic. he was in his late 70s, early 80s when that happened. And I was inspired by that because I, I said, someday, Ernie, I want to be just like you. <laughs> he says, don't ever get a stroke. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I want your perseverance of you're not going to take no for an answer. This is what nature dealt to you. You're going to deal with it, and you're going to get beyond it. And he did. That's fantastic. And he did. He died from something else. Well, let's just close with a list of um, secondary or primary prevention. How do you uh, prevent someone from having a stroke to begin with? 
And then how do you prevent them from having another one of these events should it happen? Right. And a lot of these are topics that we cover. Um, blood pressure control. I always tell people you want to control your blood pressure now or after your stroke because the biggest impact of blood pressure control is stroke prevention. Um, diabetes um, control can clearly reduce future events. Sure. Smoking, don't do it. Um, cholesterol control. And again, this is going to be looking at your population and, and does it make sense for you to have a cholesterol control program? physical activity, uh, particularly in someone who's had an event, but right. overall, increased activity, less sitting will decrease your risk of a stroke. Good. Um, and then in secondary prevention, an aspirin a day. I don't recommend an aspirin a day for everyone, no a matter what, aspirin. a baby aspirin. A One baby, baby aspirin. aspirin once a day Got it. for individuals that have already had a stroke or are at high risk for a stroke. Terrific. That's great advice. All right. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for joining us for this topic and we look forward to seeing you again. See you next time.